All right, so here we are on Tuesday, October 20th, for an interview between the Flint Journal Editorial Board and Flint Mayor Dane Walling, who's running for re-election. The purpose for this interview is for the candidate to answer questions the editorial board has as the board prepares to issue a possible endorsement in the November 3rd Flint mayoral election. Both candidates have been extended opportunities to interview with us for a possible endorsement. Members of the editorial board include the editor of the Flint Journal, Bryn Mickle, managing producer Clark Hughes, and myself, Kristen Longley, community engagement specialist for the Flint Journal Online. And I will start us off with the first question. So Mayor Walling, given Flint's <coughs> recent struggles with water and other issues. Why are you running for re-election? Why do you want to be mayor of Flint? Well, I, I have a, a deep love for this city, and I also believe strongly that it has a, a bright future in front of it. We've been through a lot in this community, uh, a lot in the last few months, few years, but even longer than that, because you know, I grew up here, I was shaped by this city. It gave me incredible opportunities growing up through the Flint Community Schools. My parents were both educators, so my wife and I are now here. Uh, we're raising our two boys in this community, and I want them to have the same kind of opportunities. I want all of our Flint kids to have those opportunities that, that we had with community education, with access to enrichment and sports and safe neighborhoods, and that's going to take a, a lot of work by a lot of people. I mean, this, is a, this is a team approach and I'm running again now because we're part way through the mission. I was elected on a platform of transforming Flint into a 21st century city with new jobs, safe neighborhoods, and great schools. And we have a lot of work to do on every one of those areas. And uh, I know over the course of this interview we'll, we'll talk about those, but I, I have a platform and plan that's based on the community's adopted comprehensive plan. Uh, I have a record of accomplishment with bringing people together around difficult issues. Uh, it's not easy to get uh, Governor Rick Snyder to go to the legislature for almost $10 million to address Flint's water problems. And we disagree on a lot of issues. We disagree on the state's takeover and Public Act 4 approach to municipalities that are in distress, but I have the experience and the relationships where I can speak directly to the governor. I can sit down across the table from the president on youth violence. I work with our congressman to get funding in for more demolition because we, we've done a lot, but we, we have thousands of more units that we still need to get down to make our community more safe and vibrant. So I'm, I'm running to fulfill you know, the mission that the community put me uh, in originally. It's been a great honor and privilege to serve. It's extremely hard. It's a difficult job. Uh, but I love this city, and I want to see us have a great future. And I believe that I have the experience and the ethics and that I'm prepared more than anyone else to lead us forward for these next four years. Thanks. When and how did you first become alarmed about lead in Flint water? Yeah, the, the alarm went off for me when the early doctors brought forward their data to us. Uh, initially with um, Senator Anna Nick, myself, the Monday before the city issued its lead advisory. Because uh, the medical data shows that this is a much different problem than anyone had, had previously understood. And that's what prompted such a different need for a response. Um, prior to that, even though I had raised my concerns with the um, emergency managers about the Flint River, um, you know, I, I tried to make that work. I, I supported the consultants coming in and looking at the system in January after the TTHM notice was in place. I supported the budget changes that allowed us to get the carbon filter in to address that over the summer. And, and it was about the same time that we were getting the notice from the MDEQ about being back in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act that, that thankfully we had doctors in our own communities who were looking at their medical records. And they saw this increase in blood lead levels among the children that, uh, initially that they had tested right there at the Hurley Medical Center. And they showed, especially among the youngest children, that there was an increased uh, rate 
uh, from those tests. And, and that was a completely different challenge than anything we had faced before. Well, it's one thing to talk about different test methodologies for water samples and the potential corrosivity of water or treatment processes. It's, it's a completely different conversation when children have elevated blood lead levels. And that's where you know, my outrage hit the ceiling and we took action as a city. I mean, it, it's questionable whether the city even had the authority to issue that kind of public health. Um, we called it a lead advisory because we wanted to get the word out. Um, the county health director was there with us and then he worked through his process so that he could issue the public health advisory and then emergency a couple days later um, because the risks were um, serious, especially for our most vulnerable families. And the family that may not be using water much in the home, that may not be flushing the systems, but we've had these lead service lines in place for a long time. But with the water, with the usage, and, and all of that was combining clearly into a scary scenario, and uh, we've come a long way on that since that point. And I certainly now look back and say, with all the other problems we already had with the river, and then on top of that, we now have a lead crisis. I mean, we should have never gone to the river in the first place. The original plan should have been followed through. The state should have provided the kind of financial assistance that myself and others have been calling for throughout this entire process. It's not just putting an emergency manager in charge of everything. It's providing real support that's going to improve the community. And, and in retrospect, because we know things now that we didn't know then, in retrospect, it was a bad decision from the beginning, but I am I am heartened by the great community response that we've seen. And you know, my opponent has talked about calling in FEMA. I I'm, would rather go to our own United Way and our own community to get bottled water and filters into our uh, homes of our most vulnerable families. Uh, FEMA, you know, would still be doing the paperwork um, where the community really came together and addressed the need. So there's a lot more that has to be looked into on this. The MDQ's admission that they misinterpreted the rule is just the start of, of what needs to be investigated. Looking back on it, do you think that there was any point where you think that you could have come out vocally and called for, uh, even if you go back to the TTHM, uh, that, that you could have been more vocal uh, in, in the run up to everything. Yes, I mean, in, in retrospect, everyone should have been more vocal. The, the EPA should have demanded that the DEQ uh, follow the interpretation that uh, apparently they've had for some time and there were email discussions about, but it never made it to myself. It didn't make it to our congressman. It didn't make it to you know, our, our water treatment staff. And, and that's a problem. I mean, th this was a, a government failure, and the MDQ has admitted that they made the uh, wrong interpretation, but the EPA needed to have been more aggressive. Uh, our, our city staff could have done more to lift up concerns. Um, I know community activists um, did a good job of, of getting the issue out there, but it was always oh, that the MDQ was providing guidance that the city's water was meeting the standards. And, and now we know the wrong standard was being applied. So we got bad information, we got bad water. Um, so I do, I mean, I look back on this and I'm committed to making sure that the city makes changes uh, around our communication protocols, um, that we better utilize the technical expertise that's available to us. So there, there's a lot of after, um, you know, looking back that we need to do differently. Um, yeah, regarding the lead, you know, in the water, we, you know, we knew back in December 2014 that, you know, there was rising level of lead in the water, 6 PDD, I think is the number, and, um, and then in the spring, I think there was, wasn't there a family that had uh, a test done in the water, mm -hmm. there was a memo mm -hmm. out there that, that the EPA properly gave the family for review that they gave to the ECLU. Um, with all that going on, you know, people start getting wrapped up about a lot of lead. Was that the time to come out and tell, tell the public more about lead in June or whatever that 
was happening? I mean, in retrospect, the time was at the very beginning when the city should have never gone to the Flint River because the DEQ wasn't prepared to support the, the usage of the Flint River. I mean, they didn't even understand how the Safe Drinking Water Act needed to be employed. So I, I go all the way back to the beginning. I mean, after a member of that, myself and city council were presented with information in March of 2013 about switching to the new pipeline. And at the time, the financial projection was that the DWSD source would be used until KWA was started. That was the vote that city council took. And I, and I publicly expressed my support, and I was at those meetings. And then the process went behind closed doors, because that's what the emergency manager law allows. There's no required consultation with me. There's no required consultation with the city council. And a decision about the city's water source and budget and all of that was made. Now, from what I knew at the time, I expected that the MDEQ would ensure that this would be done safely and responsibly. I, I expected that out of our state agencies. I mean, they're public servants too. And never mind the partisan politics about Public Act 4 or the governor, and this was our state agency that was responsible for environmental quality. I also reached out to the White House Intergovernmental Affairs about an EPA contact in January because I wanted to be able to cross-check what I was getting from the MDQ, and the EPA was not as forthcoming as it needed to be. I mean, those email exchanges with staff, those weren't getting to me. Those weren't getting to other city staff. Those concerns needed to be raised because I did expect that the state agencies, that the federal agency staff would be um, transparent about their concerns. And in retrospect, we know that was not the case on a number of occasions. So I, mean, I go all the way back on this to the Flint River decision and then around TTHMs and the email exchanges around corrosion control. There were many opportunities for this to have been avoided, but I don't think anyone should get the wrong impression that whether myself or a city council member last, you know, January or February or March um, said we should go in a different direction, that anything different would have happened. Because we raised that concern about police funding. We raised it about senior centers, the Human Relations Commission. I mean, there were a large number of things that we disagreed with the emergency managers on. But Public Act 4 gives them the full authority to consult with Treasury, sign those resolutions, and spend our taxpayer dollars uh, in those ways that they deem appropriate. So, um, I, I do see that um, opportunity having been there, but I, I don't think the community should mistake you know, who was making the decisions and what authority was in place. Um, you had said, just going back to what you said a couple answers ago, you said, I'm committed to making sure the city makes changes on things like communications protocols. Yeah. Can you just expand a little bit on that? Yeah, the, the, the city administrator and it will be uh, conducting an internal review around our, our city water operations, uh, how notifications uh, from the DEQ or the EPA were being shared um, throughout our chain of command. We have a utilities administrator who started this year, who, who has the F1 license. That was one of the things that the city administrator demanded. So you got to remember that the, none of the emergency managers had experience running a water treatment plant. And the utilities administrator, who was in that position, uh, didn't have the licenses and certifications. Uh, that's now changed. And the city administrator was responsible for a water treatment plant in Muskegon Heights. Uh, and when she came in, she saw uh, not the need for more consultants. Her, her um, expectation was that the city would have qualified staff in its own structure. Um, so she's been working very closely with the utilities administrator. And, and even when you go back to the August 17th letter, that came from the Department of Environmental Quality around corrosion control, that didn't get to her as fast as it needed to. So uh, we're going to look at all of that. I, I think the state is primarily responsible, but we can't stop there. This isn't about you know a, a blame game. There's enough blame to go around, and the state is primarily responsible, given the decisions that were made and the MDEQ's failures. But the city needs to learn from this. The EPA needs to learn from this because 
We can't have this happen to another community. It just it, You cannot go months and months and months and not be using the right standards on your city's drinking water, especially a city as distressed and vulnerable as ours. So we're going to conduct that full internal review and understand uh, who knew what, when, and what changes we need to make to ensure that we're doing everything we can at any given time to protect the public's health. Um, a lot of families in the city right now are um, getting their water tested. Have you had your water tested at home? I have not. Why not? Um, well, we, we've um, used our refrigerator filter for drinking water since we moved into the house. That's um, something we've always done. And, you know, I certainly knew that older pipes were, you know, a challenge in the community. So as the information came out in you know, September, um, we started you know, flushing our, our cold water faucet for five minutes in the morning. Um, I've, I've, I've been really busy, frankly, just working on this, and I felt between the filter and the flushing, um, I also know that, I mean, every house can vary, um, but the age that um, the neighborhood that I happen to live in was, was built it's more a matter of the, the water inside of your internal uh, household plumbing. Uh, there aren't the lead service lines in, in our um, kind of the, the area that I live in. So, yeah. so along those lines of the of the lead service lines, uh, what have you done to see the long term fix for the uh, water infrastructure for the city yeah. starts right away? Yeah, that that's. Um, a major priority for me because we dealt with the immediate need for corrosion control by switching to the Detroit water. Um, but we have to fix the broader infrastructure problems that we have. And my first call to the governor before understanding that the MDQ didn't have corrosion control right for us was um, to demand $10 million to begin a service line replacement program. The, the research all shows that if you really want to reduce the lead and copper, you can't just replace the city side of the line, you have to replace the full service line. So um, my expectation is that the state will provide at least $10 million for us to do full service line replacements. Uh, we need to start with those in the households that have uh, tested a high and eliminate that lead from their environment. There may be lead paint or other concerns in any given area, but we need to get the lead lines out of the system. Some homeowners in this community can afford that themselves, just like they can pay for a new furnace or a new roof. And um, a city program may provide an incentive for them to remove their lead line, but not pay the full cost. We need to focus on households that are vulnerable, uh, where lead has been tested high, where children are present, uh, make sure that that risk is eliminated. So we're pursuing state funding. We're looking at what we can do with community development block grant that we already have and can reprogram. And, um, and between that and, and homeowners taking action themselves, um, I'm confident that we can get a few thousand of the 15,000 lead lines removed. And like the rest of our capital improvement plan, we have to pursue this over multiple years. When the Planning Commission sees that revised or, or draft revision of the capital improvement plan this year, they're going to see the replacement of lead service lines as, as an issue. Is there any indication uh, to you right now of, uh, of what, if any, damage the, uh, the, the last you know, however many months of using the Flint River water uh, in the way it was treated has done to the system, has done to the pipes, and you know, the, the notion of you know, what the fix will be and if this will resolve the problem? Yeah, there, there will need to be other changes. I think everyone who's looked at this says that the system has gone through this additional stress. Um, estimates vary on what kind of damage may have been caused, so this will be discussed during our capital improvement plan revision. We need to recognize that this change has happened and figure out the solution for it. Um, the leak detection work we're doing, we're always out working on now the valves and the main repairs. We're going to need to do some intensive investigation to understand the strength of the infrastructure system because that's the long-term foundation for us. And when people bring up questions about affordability, you have to have a secure system. And then, of course, it needs to be you know, sustainable for the customers, but if you don't have a system that's providing safe water, 
then uh, the, the rest of the discussion uh, is, is really you know, requires the first to get, to get done. So that needs to be investigated. Okay, so, so in hindsight on this, on this lead wire thing, it's clear to me from, from the earlier comments that um, you would have never switched over to the Flint River. You would have stayed with Detroit as the Air Council wanted in March 13, I think it was, right? Um, and then you said things went behind closed doors. In retrospect, how should that process have worked? You know, I mean, given there was an emergency manager, should that process have been more transparent, more open, involve the council with you, or what? Look, I don't agree with the state takeover approach to begin with, because especially with distressed communities, you're seeing the Detroit Public Schools now. It, it, it misses the point. The Detroit Public Schools have been under emergency managers for a very long time, but the, the challenges are still there. Same is true of, of Flint or, or Pontiac. So, if a Republican governor wants a state takeover approach, then you still have to have the community involved in a public way. And there needs, in my view, there, there need to be meetings and consultations. Much more of that was happening in the last year while the emergency manager was here than at the time we were discussing. So that's why I ask people to look carefully at the record. We had four different emergency managers, three different state laws. One of those emergency managers was here twice. So it's very difficult to look back at each of those phases. But I believe it would be responsible in light of this problem for the state legislatures and the governor to amend Public Act 4. I mean, I, again, I don't agree with it in the first place, but to amend it to ensure that there is regular community consultation the city council and I got it right on the KWA and the regional pipeline, and I believe the public scrutiny around that issue, around the scenarios, the, the Flint River issues, Detroit's cost, the new pipeline, I think that improved the process. And we had a community consensus by the time the city council voted. There was nothing of a community consensus around the Flint River. It was, this is what we're doing. Detroit cut us off, and instead of going back and negotiating like the county did, the emergency manager just picked a direction and went that way. And, and clearly, not even the state was prepared to implement that solution. So, you've come under a lot of fire um, for this, and it did happen while you were mayor, the, mm -hmm. the water crisis. So, why should voters reelect you? Why should they elect you over your opponent? Well, I've, I have fought and worked for this community you know, every single day for six years. And the emergency managers are now gone. And that was a part of my commitment to this community. I, I was elected on the same day that the governor announced that there was going to be a takeover in 2011. And the emergency manager completely eliminated my salary. There was no clear way that myself or city council were going to be involved. But I went to work every single one of those days because I knew that a day would come when the emergency managers would be gone and I would be here with my family. And my parents would be here and my grandmother would be here and our classmates and friends and people who have given so much would still be here. So I wasn't going to, to give up or go away. I stayed at the table. I did everything I could with the power that I had. And if you go back, I spoke up on a large number of issues. I spoke up on charter reform, on public safety millage when we needed more resources for police and fire protection. I demanded that we follow through on our comprehensive master plan. You know, the emergency managers got rid of blight um, and code enforcement. They got rid of the ombudsman office. You know, I fought and fought to make sure we kept that comprehensive planning process going. Because we didn't have a vision as a community since 1960 of where we were going to go. So that's why I ask people to look carefully at my record. See what issues I stood up on. See where my priorities have been. And I believe that we're now in a position where we can do some great things for Flint. Our plan just got 
recognized as being the best comprehensive plan in the state of Michigan. We have the information we need to eliminate blight in this community over the next four years. We have the city's first capital improvement plan is in place. We have a two-year budget. We have a five-year financial projection. I mean, these things are, are so different from what I inherited six years ago, it's hard to describe. There were no strategic plan, no two-year budget, no master plan. Those principles were not enshrined in our charter. We didn't have the resources we needed um, the way the community has committed them through the millage and, and other ways. So that's, that's why you know, I believe that I'm the best person to lead this city forward. This is a complex situation with the state oversight board in place, emergency manager's order still there. We are in the middle of a crisis. But I have the experience and I have the ethics to lead our community forward over these, these next four years. As you look at that, and I think you've addressed uh, a lot of the points in my next question, but uh, you know, as far as why residents should have confidence that we won't end up under another state takeover, uh, have you been given any indication when the State Oversight Board will come to an end and when we'll be back under complete home rule? Well, that's, that's a question for the governor, which is another one of these problems with Public Act 4. There's, there's no exit criteria. That's beyond, there's an exit for the financial emergency, which has been declared over in the city of Flint. But there's no exit criteria for state oversight. And that's wrong. And the public has a right to know what this process is all about. It shouldn't be dependent on one governor in Lansing making these decisions. But that's how that law was written. And it was passed on a party line vote with not a single Democrat in either house or the Senate supporting that. And that's, that's the wrong way to make public policy. So, you know, now we have a state oversight board. Um, the only thing that the state um, board members have told me is that at approximately a year's point, they'll take a look at the resolutions and actions that have brought before them. They'll assess the, the level of cooperation between myself and city council. And at that point, there could be some changes. That's, that's all I know. And, and that's probably um, not even fair of them to say because it's not their decision. Has the oversight board impacted your ability to lead up to this point? And if so, how? So far, that oversight board has approved everything the administration has wanted to do to a, to a, to a resolution. So uh, there have been two cases. The administration, you mean Snyder's administration? or No, the by, by the city's administration, okay. yeah. So every resolution that we brought forward, um, the oversight board has approved. You know, they, they approve um, 20 hours of city council's work in, in about 30 minutes. And that happens once a month. I'm there. Uh, I present briefly to the board. The other staff are available. And uh, there have been two occasions where the city council has wanted to go in a different direction, once on a tax incentive and once on a budget amendment, where the transition board has come back and said that they would approve the city administration's uh, original proposal, and that's what they did. So it hasn't been a problem here, and that is something else that I hope people see, because I'm committed to getting this over with as fast as possible. I don't like the rules of the game. I don't like how the deck has been stacked. But I'm going to get this community past this as soon as possible. And that means working in a professional way with that board, getting their business conducted, meeting all the required deadlines for financial reports, strategic plan updates, um, information on meetings. And the city administrator and chief financial officer have been very effective at doing that. And, and I think we can um, be out from under that state oversight you know, as, as soon as the governor will just allow it. I don't see what's holding us back at this point. Okay, switch a little uh, direction here from water for a minute. Um, what's your position on a city manager form of government? Yeah, I, I was asked that earlier today. I'm in favor of a strong mayor form of government. 
the Blue Ribbon Commission that I participated in, another one of those things I did to make sure my voice was at the table and that I could be a part of moving the process along, uh, that recommended what some call a hybrid. Uh, I believe in a strong mayor elected citywide with executive authority, including appointment authority. Now beyond that, I don't, I think there are some things in our current charter that could be changed. We just have one version of a strong mayor. Uh, I think there should be fewer appointments because our system needs to be streamlined and efficient uh, in 2015-16 versus 1974 and 1975. So I think the mayor should have fewer appointments. I think it should be a performance-based management process that's encoded in the charter. Um, there needs to be more extensive budget guidance which constrains the executive branch. Uh, and if those things were done, we would get some of the professional management benefits that people see in the city manager system without giving up the, the power and importance of a strong mayor position leading you know, this region's central city, um, being at the table with the U.S. Conference of Mayors, other organizations as a strong representative. So uh, I'm in favor of a strong mayor making these reforms that, that some would call a hybrid, um, but I think still fit with a full-time citywide elected executive who you know, represents the entire community and has to work with a council um, and whether or not a mayor should be voting on a council or not, I mean, that's one of those discussions that I think the Charter Review Commission needs to have. I, I, could, um, I could go either, either way on that and I, I think the, the community should give some thought to those. So, like a hybrid, you know, I guess we've got a hybrid style right now. We've got a pretty capable, strong city administrator. Mm -hmm. um, is that kind of what you're talking about? Have a professional administrator? Yeah. Uh, I think what we have now looks similar to what I envisioned. I think there still needs to be more alignment with our, our departments and the charter and some clear lines of accountability. Uh, I'd like to see our chief financial officer not be able to be you know, removed without a public process. That's um, what's necessary with our I think both our clerk and treasurer now. I think that needs to be extended to the CFO. Um, same with the city administrator. Under the current orders, it would require myself, the city council, and the RTAB to all agree on a new city administrator. Under the charter, as it exists, that's entirely at the pleasure of the mayor. There's no performance review required. It's just entirely at the pleasure of the mayor. So, yeah, th those are the kind of changes that I think we need to make. We need professional management. It needs to be efficient, accountable, streamlined. It needs to be very budget conscious. Our, our current charter had two sentences on the budget before it was amended, and it had four pages on the Civil Service Commission. And now we have state and federal laws that make sure employees are treated fairly by their employer, but we need a lot more than two sentences in the charter to ensure that a mayor is providing quarterly updates, quarterly budget amendments, doing all the things that smart cities are doing. We can do those now going forward. doesn't mean we have a lot of money to work with, but we can use that money very efficiently and effectively while we fight for more support from you know, the state government and from a more productive partnership with the federal level. Um, you talked about appointments. Um, uh, the Flint Police Chief, uh, Chief Tolbert, was appointed by the emergency manager. Um, how would you rate Chief Tolbert's performance and would you keep him on as chief if we elected? Um, yes, I want to see Chief Tolbert continue. I think he's been a strong, uh, solid A. He's worked incredibly hard for this community and with the size force that he has to work with, we are making some great progress on reducing violent crime, uh, providing better customer service through uh, alternative uh, technologies and um, better training and um, uh, protocols in place with the 911 dispatchers. And he's, he's very visionary. Uh, he looks forward. He prepares for you know, the challenges of a changing environment. And, and he has you know, the support of a lot of the men and women who come to work for the department. So I, I want him to stay. 
and, and I, I encourage them to do so. You talk about the about the crime. Uh, what do you attribute the uh, spike in homicides this year uh, to? Yeah, that's uh, something that our law enforcement officers and prosecutors are all trying to figure out um, because they the cases weren't connected with each other. There was a number of different cases that all happened within a short period of time. So there has to be a lot more work done with, with technology and with data, with the new violence reduction network that we've been invited and accepted to be a part of with the U.S. Department of Justice. There are a lot of new tools that can uh, identify both um, past perpetrators and offenders understand their, their networks um, so that we really get to putting law enforcement resources um, to investigate and, if necessary, you know, arrest and apprehend the individuals who are causing harm to our community. Um, so I think we need to do more with analytics, with predictive policing. Um, our investigations of those cases were, were tremendous. I mean, the state police being with us on the major crimes investigative unit um, we are you know, at solving cases, but we want to move from solving cases to preventing cases. And uh, that's, that's what the department is, is focusing on now, is how to become more proactive, understand uh, potential networks, figure out what it will take to diffuse those networks. And my hope is that, that Flint is able to see some of the federal grants that Detroit did after becoming a part of the Violence Reduction Network. So we get some additional resources in here, not just police, but also community resources, so that we can interrupt violence, we can call in and support individuals who haven't yet committed a violent crime, help them turn their lives around. That, that all takes resources, and I'm hoping that uh, those come to us and we'll be working you know, to bring those through the Violence Reduction Network. One of the things the, uh, the state takeover uh, did bring with it was that infusion of more state troopers in flight. It is the city moves away from state oversight, uh, are you concerned that we'll lose that resource and is Flint in a position to police itself without that level of assistance from the state? The city needs a partnership. There's no question about that. And, and we still need additional resources for our own department. And the governor's heard that from me and the, the chief and others. The governor has committed on this one. One of the areas where him and I are in agreement is that the state needs to be a strong part of the solution. And the Secure Cities Initiative, which he announced and, and actually came to Flint to make the announcement, um, is, is going to continue, my understanding. That, that was not about state takeovers, that was about the cities with um, high rates of violent crime across the state. And, and that needs to continue. The legislature needs to make that a priority. You know, a state agency has flexible resources that they can draw in, and they have a level of, of technology and analysis that you're not going to get even in the biggest you know, local police departments um, outside of you know, New York City or Los Angeles. So the, the state police have been a, a tremendous resource. And I see it as a partnership. We need revenue sharing and other changes so we can put more Flint police officers on the street, but we need those 50 plus Michigan State Police Troopers support in the Detective Bureau, the support with technology and data um, that can be shared across multiple jurisdictions because what, what we want is, yes, we need Flint to be more safe, but for this state to really thrive, for Michigan's reputation to change across the country, across the continent, you know, the, the world, we can't have cities with the highest violent crime rates just changing places on the list. I mean, this has to be one of those radical changes that we see in Detroit, in Flint, Pontiac. You know, Lansing's a lot higher than a lot of people recognize on a per capita basis and, and other pockets in the state. So um, that's, that's something that the governor has been willing to step up on um, and, and I I need them, you know, we need them to continue to provide those resources because we would not be in a good position without the proactive patrols of the state police. And don't forget, the state's providing money for the, for the lockup to be open. I've been a proponent of that lockup, uh, even the idea of a local millage to pay for it. The state paying for the lockup, state police, there's prosecutors at, at the county, uh, 
Uh, we, we have to have that partnership. Is there any concern, though, that as you know, we look at water and everything else, that Lansing starts to look at the number of resources that are going into Flint, and that some of those resources get redeployed to water? I'm, I'm very concerned about that. I'm also concerned about the state taking money from our cities and our schools to fill potholes. Uh, so th this is an ongoing you know, struggle for Flint. We have to have a strong presence in Lansing. We have very active delegation there with Representative Phelps and Neely, and, and now with Senator Ananick. Um, he's on the Democratic side of the aisle like I am, but he's in a leadership position. And, and that means that you know, Flint's going to continue to be a part of the discussions. We need to see changes in revenue sharing and, and direct support to our cities. We certainly can't have the state taking more away from us for you know, police, or from revenue sharing because they won't accept the need for other funding on roads. Uh, and the same goes for our schools. I mean, we, we can't have our, our charter and our Flint community schools in this city you know, struggling to pay their bills because the state won't have a serious conversation about what it takes to actually educate our kids. I mean, what about 12-month schools for you know, communities across the state, not just Flint? I mean, that would fill a real need for a lot of our families, and it would up our, our children's educational performance and literacy. I and mean, that's the foundation of a strong economy. And, and we're not doing those things. And too often in Lansing, the, the, the conversation's not even taking place, but um, by Flint's active participation in the Michigan Municipal League, uh, me being co-chair of the Urban Core Mayors, a position I just started a couple months ago after Mayor Duggan and Mayor Hartwell uh, stepped down, there's um, a lot of work that has to constantly be done, and, and that's where the experience really makes a difference. If someone starts over at this point in the process, everything under Public Act 4, the Oversight Board, the Water Crisis, the EPA, um, that person's going to lose a lot of time. And with the, with the state the ultimate, with the ultimate responsibility for what happens in Flint, uh, for the past four years, effectively, um, what have you done that you can take to voters and say, "This is what I've accomplished yeah. during my term in office"? Well, early on, after the emergency manager uh, eliminated my pay and city council's pay, the first major assignment that came to my desk was to work on the comprehensive plan. That was a grant that I had personally helped write to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development with you know, my background in, in urban planning. And the city had that grant, but we had not started expending the dollars because the emergency manager was looking at it. And I received the support for the chief planning officer who I had selected from a national pool um, to be hired. So Megan Hunter was my top recommendation uh, based on the process we had done in 2011, before the election, and um, she was able to come on as the chief planning officer. We ran a community engagement process like this community had never seen. We had 300 meetings, 5,000 people involved. We looked at land use. We talked about people's ideas of shrinking cities and changing infrastructure and um, what needed to be done to improve our parks, our neighborhoods. I mean, you name it, it's, it's, it's covered in that plan. So I spent an inordinate amount of time of mine in that process. And I, and I think the plan speaks for itself. We got a unanimous vote from the Planning Commission and the City Council while under emergency management. That's how much confidence people had in the plan that the community put together. And I was proud to be a, a big part of that, but it really was a community effort, and that's what made it a success. From that, you know, I, I drove the initial work around the blight elimination framework. I made the commitment in my state of the city that we would eliminate blight in this community in five years. And we've made you know, tens of millions of dollars of progress on that since I made that announcement in, in May. So you know, we're, we're really driving the agenda forward. And there were things that uh, didn't come to my desk that I wasn't consulted on, but I was uh, deeply involved in the master planning process. I continued to be the citizen's point of contact. You know, emergency manager said, you know, you got a problem, you got to talk to the mayor. So I'm there at the desk during my open office times every week 
to hear from our citizens, to follow up with staff, to respond to their, their issues. And then also with economic development, I continue to serve on the economic development boards, be the primary point of contact for businesses, and to ensure that you know, our staff responded along with community partners. Because I had proven um, with Diplomat's investment, with General Motors pledges, and through the master plan that you know, I was the person who could best you know, drive those projects forward and make sure that there was the focus um, from a team effort to, to get the job done. And then you go back to my first two years before we had an emergency manager, and we had a, a great neighborhood engagement process uh, without any grant money that brought together people in every ward to identify some immediate action steps. So I demanded double-digit concessions from our unions. Uh, not all of them cooperated with that, but you know, I stood up for fiscal responsibility. Um, I was willing to, to raise the rates on, on the water and sewer systems when it was clear to me that without some changes that we wouldn't have a system that was safe and secure. And that's not an easy decision to make um, when you're in a, you know, a special election um, or, or you know, in a special term in a short period of time. But I, I have to put my head down on the pillow at night and live with my own conscience. Um, and I try to be the best public servant I can for this community. Uh, I, I never went away. I never quit working for this community. You know, I change my salary you know, every couple months. Um, but I continue to do the job because that's what I feel I'm called to do. And until the, um, or as long as the community keeps me there, then, then that's how I'm going to operate. Um, Flint is continuing to lose people. People are leaving the city. What needs to be done to lure people and businesses back to Flint, and how will you specifically contribute to that? The, the number one thing the city has to do is, is eliminate blight. I mean, that's, that's the foundation for our, our growth. Um, you're not going to see the rebound of neighborhood property values if every you know, fifth house is, is vacant, uh, abandoned, or, or burned out. So we have to create an environment where property values stabilize, where people see you know, a future for themselves and their kids, and the same is true of businesses. I mean, we have over 500 commercial buildings across our commercial corridors that are blighted and abandoned and need to be demolished. So that blight elimination framework is it's over 100 pages long. We have data on all 52,000 parcels in the city of Flint. We know exactly what we need to do, and all we need is the state and federal governments to get with the program and provide the resources so that we can get that job done. The city of Flint cannot move forward We've seen this over the decades. If it's blight, 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 we're not going to move forward. We've got to pay the bill. We've got to clear it and really create this opportunity. Because if we do that, then our vision can really take over of a positive future. I think there is a demand for green, urban neighborhoods where you can live you know, in a house that wasn't just built in the last 10 years in the suburbs and, and have a sense of community. It may not be uh, as many houses on the block as when it was originally built, but you can have that sense of community on a block and still have had a few demolitions done so that the, um, you know, the market for that neighborhood can be strong. We have a vision of adding thousands of new living opportunities in and around downtown Flint and along the, the University Avenue corridor. If there could be you know, 10,000 more people living in apartments and condominiums and lofts. We've never had those places in our city until the last few years. And, and there's a huge market for that. And we're the hub of this entire region. We have tens of thousands of people coming to work every day at our medical centers, our colleges and universities, diplomats, specialty pharmacy, General Motors. You know, our, our daytime population is growing, even though our residential population is declining. And we need to recognize that there's an opportunity there for residential redevelopment. There's an opportunity for commercial and retail redevelopment. It has to be compact. It has to be in the right places. And that's what the plan really lays out. Um, we're also going to have to tackle the challenges around education and schools. And as a mayor in Michigan, we don't have direct authority over those things. But we have the Flint schools at the table with our community plan. We had uh, both superintendents who were here during that process. We had uh, school board members physically you know, at the meetings 
representing that school board, and um, that's going to make you know, a, a positive difference. Uh, community education was a shared families, you know, our economy. So those are those are the kind of um, opportunities that I see for us, and how the city specifically needs to be involved. I mean, we're talking about all the other basic services, so those are, of course, are included. You have to have solid infrastructure. You have to have police and fire protection, and, and we're working you know, very hard on those like we've talked about. But there are specific leadership opportunities that the city alone has to pursue, and, and that's uh, where my focus um, has been, even through those times of the emergency manager being here. And I think those will pay some major dividends for our community in the next few years if we stay the course. So given, given that, I'm curious, uh, what is your 60 second pitch, your elevator pitch for why people should come to Flint? Yeah. I mean, if they look at it, at it on the news and see, you know, the water has let in, the homicide rate, um, you know, the crime, you know, there's all these negatives that go, what's your 60 second pitch for why Flint? Well, the city's a, a place of great opportunity and, and that's what had always defined us. I mean, we were, because of General Motors, we were that place for many decades. But we now have one of the best comprehensive plans in the country. The emergency managers are behind us. We do have a much more collaborative environment than, than I started in, you know, six and eight years ago. And when you put all that together, then that creates an opportunity for um, students to come from around the world to study here. It creates an opportunity for entrepreneurs to find a niche build a product, sell it here, sell it around the world. You know, there are great partners to help businesses with that. And I'm, I'm a pro-growth progressive. I mean, I'm, I'm about getting things done, but supporting you know, our business community and the private sector um, because that creates prosperity for us. So if, if you're not up for a challenge, then don't come to Flint. But if, if you're someone who can tackle a tough challenge, and if you um, see some opportunities where other people don't always see them, then, then this is a great place for you. If given the opportunity, um, what's uh, one or two questions you would ask your opponent? Mm -hmm. I have really focused on you know, moving this city forward the last um, few months. The, the campaign, of course, is, is part of my job, too, in, in wanting you know, to be reelected. Um, uh, I would ask her some detailed questions about the budget, because as far as I can tell, um, she's talked about her experience in other organizations, but she hasn't, um, throughout the times I've been with her, um, seemed to understand how the city's budget works, the, the multiple funds, the accounts. She's, she's made the accusation that you know, we're not doing enough with grants. But look at the track record. When we got the Safer Grant, you know, four years in a row, we got the Sustainable Communities Grant, Building Neighborhood Capacity for the North Side, Choice Neighborhoods for the South Side, Community Policing Grants, My Foundation's Investing in Communications, again. I mean, I, so I, I would ask your questions about you know, the budget, the projections, um, and, and the, other, um, the other question for me would be, how does she intend to be a mayor for the whole city? Because I haven't seen her campaigning across the whole city. Um, I don't see the people around her um, being individuals who have a history of embracing the entire city. And you know, the first thing you are as a mayor is you're, you're the representative of the entire community, not just the part of the community that votes for you. Um, so you know, that would be my other question for her based on observing her, her campaign and comments. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Just, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't touched on? We got through a pretty long list, pretty long list of questions, and you did ask me up front about you know, why I'm why I'm running again. I, I just believe deeply in Flint and our future here, and I, I believe I'm the right person to lead us forward for these next four years. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. You're welcome.